Okay, there we go. So, welcome everyone. It is my pleasure to have you here in this uh, great new auditorium. Um, my name is Michael Stapelberg. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want. And uh, this presentation is going to be about a project of mine called Distri, which is short for Linux distribution because it doesn't need to be any more specific than that. Uh, the subtitle is that package managers are too slow. And when I say package managers, I'm referring to Linux distribution package managers. But I think that the uh, lessons and points that I'm going to make in this talk are going to be applicable to other package managers or module systems or whatever you have as well. So um, let's hope that this works. Um, if not, I can. I have these canned as well. Um, oh, there we go. OK, so when I say they are too slow, on the left-hand side, I'm going to show you the installation in Debian of the ACK program. And uh, this took four seconds now. Um, ACK is a tiny replacement for grep, which you might have used. Uh, it is a 50 kilobytes or something like that of Perl script. Um, and this took four seconds to install in Debian. Now, um, sorry, if we go back here and uh, look at the same thing in Distri, um, you can see that the same installation operation of the same piece of software completes in 0.5 seconds. Now, this might not be a big difference, but um, let me assure you that this also holds true for larger packages. Um, to it, I have the QMU package, which, uh, if we're going to install it uh, again in Debian on the left-hand side, it's going to take a little while. Um, I'm doing all of these tests on a very fast computer with like a gigabit internet connection, very modern CPU, lots of RAM, lots of fast storage, um, so there's really no reason for this to be slow at all. And yet, I can talk about all of this here while we're waiting for QMU to be installed. Uh, in fact, it takes like 17 seconds, a little over 17 seconds to install QMU. And in Distri, as sort of a benchmark of where we could be going with this, um, the installation of QMU finishes in a mere 3.5 seconds. So uh, there's quite a lot of difference here. So this bears the question, why are package managers so slow? And this is not just Debian. I'm not trying to rip on Debian here. Um, this affects all of the package managers across the board. So I've put a couple of the Linux distributions that are popular here on the slide. Um, there's more distributions, of course, but many of them are just derivatives of the big distributions, so to say. And this table is sorted by wall clock time, meaning how long it takes to install the ACK program. Now, in the first column, in the first row, uh, you can see that Fedora, with its DNF or RPM package manager, needs to download 100 megabytes from the internet before it can install 50 kilobytes of Perl. And it does so at a data rate of almost 4 megabytes per second. Now, the data rate is not actually that bad. If we look at NixOS, which has like an entirely from scratch implemented package manager, so no like old burdens from the older package management um, code bases, it still takes 12 seconds and comes out at a data rate of merely 1.25 megabytes per second. The same holds true for Debian. Then we come to Arch Linux, which is a bit faster, and then Alpine is finally somewhat acceptable. Now, I ask you, like, if you see a data rate of one megabyte per second, like, doesn't that isn't that terrible? Like, look at what computers can accomplish. Even like old laptops from 10 years ago will have hard disks onto which you can write with hundreds of megabytes per second. So what could possibly be taking these package managers so long? So let's recap. Um, why are package managers slow? Well, we have the two most widely used package formats. We have Debian packages, um, which are essentially a tar archive in a Unix archive. And then we have RPM, which used to stand for the Red Hat Package Manager. It's now a backronym, which is a little bit of metadata around CPIO archives. The task of a package manager in general is to make the package contents available. So when you run a command such as apt install nginx, you expect that afterwards you have a program called nginx that you can just run on your server or computer or mobile device. So traditionally, the way package managers go about this is they need to resolve the package dependencies, then they need to download maybe package lists before, but then for sure at least the archives of the packages that we're talking about, they need to extract the packages, they need to configure the software, and on top of all of that, they need to do careful F-sync system calls to make sure all of this I.O. is happening as safely as possible. Because if your laptop battery dies in the middle of an installation, you want your system to still start up when you get around to turning your laptop back on. 
Okay, so now that we have established what they do, the question bears asking, how can we go faster? Um, as a little disclaimer, I'm not saying that the code bases that we have are already like perfectly optimized, so maybe there's like a lot of things that we can do in the existing package managers, but I was more researching this problem from the perspective of how could we go faster if we were to start over from scratch. So the main idea of this talk is uh, to use an append-only package store of immutable images. Now that's quite a mouthful, and I'm gonna break it down for you. So the first part is we use an image format, for example, SquashFS images, but it could also be CD images or any sort of image format, instead of an archive format. And then we go on to mount all of these images under their own path, which is a concept that I'm gonna call separate hierarchies in this talk. So we have, uh, for example, the Nginx package that we had as an example on the previous slide. It would be made available in slash RO for read-only, slash Nginx AMD64 1.14.1. You can see that this package name is sort of fully qualified. So there's both the architecture of the package in there and also the full version number. And this holds true for all of the packages on the system. So for example, the Z-Shell package would also be in this hierarchy. It would have its own hierarchy under this mount point, um, and so on for all of the other packages. The rest of the system is laid out as usual, so you have your typical slash Etsy for configuration files, uh, slash var for data, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the advantages? Well, first of all, if we use an image format, we can now just mount the image instead of having to extract it. And if you think about it, mounting an image is nothing more than initializing a file system reader for it, whereas extracting it means you need to read it from start to finish, and then you need to write all of its contents, which might be compressed, so you also need to decompress it, all over again onto your system in a way that is not sequential, because you have many different bits and pieces that need to go in many different file system locations. So the extraction is a massive part of what makes package installation slow. And conversely, if we just mount images, we will have much faster package installation. Now, one side effect of this that I didn't actually imagine when I went into the project is that this also makes build environment composition much faster. And what I mean by this is that in modern Linux distributions, whenever you're working on them as a packager, you will typically use a separate tool to build packages so that your system state does not leak into the packages that you're building and then distributing. Um, these tools typically work by copying around like a change root and then um, having a copy on write overlay and actually installing all of the software. And this can take anywhere from dozens of seconds to minutes even before your actual build of the software that you want to build even starts. Um, in Distri, however, due to the fact that we just need to mount a couple of images, this is all done in a split fraction of a second. So this really changes the feel of how you go about working with distribution packages. Furthermore, I mentioned that we're using a package store that is append only. So that means that if we only ever add to it, there's no need to make sure that mutations are safe because we're only ever adding to it. So we can now use unsafe IO. We don't need to block on the hard disk or SD card or whatever slow storage medium that you might have. And lastly, the image contents are immutable, so that means it's no longer possible to screw up your system installation, uh, be it by accident because you fat fingered a delete, a delete command and accidentally wiped out half of your system, or be it intentionally if you have malware that's trying to uh, install itself onto your system. One more piece of the puzzle that I want to give you is that we build packages hermetically in Distri, which means that when you run the program, it will use the same version of the dependencies as when it was built. Um, we accomplish this by using a, wrap, a wrapper script around the actual executables in the package, which then sets uh, environment variables such as LD library path, Python path, Perl 5 lib, etc., to like the fully qualified dependency versions. All right, so with these separate hierarchies concept, there is one wrinkle, which is that if you have all of the programs installed into separate hierarchies, how are they going to talk to each other? And there's a couple of examples for this where packages need to exchange data with each other via directories that have a well-known path on the file system. As just two examples, consider the manual page viewer man, which when you started to look at the man page of Nginx, would need to look into user share man and locate the man page file in there. Or as another example, consider GCC, the C compiler. When you're building a program that links against libUSB, it will need to locate the header file in user include. So the approach that Distri takes here is we emulate the well-known paths. So for example, if you look at user include jpeglib.h on a Distri system, it is a symlink to the fully qualified slash ro slash libjpeg, et cetera. What are the advantages of using separate hierarchies? Well, we're moving conflicts from package installation time to program execution time. 
And when I say conflicts at program execution time, what I mean is whenever a user interactively tries to start a program. So if you in your shell are typing Python, then of course we need to make a choice. Is this Python 2.7 or Python 3? Um, but for the packages themselves, because they're built hermetically, they will always use the specific version of the dependency that they were built with. So this is not like random conflicts at runtime. It is only that um, the user at some point needs to make a choice which program to start. But in general, packages are always co-installable on Distri. And you might be saying, well, the Python example is not very convincing because in Debian today, I can also just install Python 2.7 and Python 3 at the same time, right? And that's true, but Distri takes this concept a step further. You can always co-install any package. So for example, if you're using Zshell and you're using version 5.6.2, you could update to 5.6.3, and if that breaks your config, it's no big deal. You just start the old version again and it will keep working. And then you can decide how you want to handle this issue, if you want to change your config file, or if you want to remove the new version, file an upstream bug report, etc. But most importantly, this also means that our package manager can be entirely version agnostic. So this entirely eliminates the dependency resolution phase that other package managers need to do when you tell them to install or update your system. So for example, when I last updated my Debian workstation, it took well over a minute of app just sitting there and resolving dependencies. Um, and I'm not saying that it's entirely optimized, as I mentioned, but this just takes way too long. And if we can do away with it entirely, that's great. Furthermore, this eliminates the need for global metadata. No longer is it necessary to download all of these metadata files like Fedora does, like 100 megabytes of package catalog, um, just to resolve the conflicts between packages. We now only need the package-specific metadata subset. So this makes that step much faster as well. Now, I mentioned immutability already, and you might be wondering, well, if package contents and exchange directories are read-only, doesn't that sometimes go wrong? And the answer is yes, rarely there are programs that do expect the system to be writable. It is, however, not a general case because of live CDs that typically have a read-only environment um, and other environments where you don't have write access. But in this case, I stumbled upon a program which is part of GNOME, the G-Settings uh, schema program, which wants to write a sort of cache file in one of our exchange directories. Now, that doesn't work, and I'm arguing that such designs should be improved upstream. Uh, the GNOME people should re-architect this program such that they follow these three ideals that I have formulated here for a good cache. I'm saying that good caches should not be required. Whenever a cache file is not present, your program should still keep working and just maybe be a little bit slower than if it had the cache. Secondly, good caches should be transparently created. There should not be a separate step that you need to execute and that you need to keep up to date. The program itself should do that. And thirdly, good caches should automatically be updated whenever that's necessary. All right. Um, so. I think the last piece of the puzzle here is that um, in Distri, there are no hooks and no triggers. A hook is sometimes also called a maintainer script or a post-in script. There are many different names for it, but essentially what it means is that there is a little program that is being run after package installation. These programs are typically um, shipped with the package by the package maintainer. So the package maintainer can just supply an arbitrary little bit of code that the package manager then runs. There's also triggers, and the trigger is kind of like a hook, except it runs after some other package is being installed. Uh, as an example, in Debian, there is the mandb package, which contains the man page viewer, and that it sets up a trigger, which runs whenever another package is installed that contains a manual page. Now, as per Debian policy, every program needs to contain a manual page. So the mandb trigger runs whenever you install another program. And what it does is it will create a full text index of all of the man pages so that you can later use the apropos command to search through the man pages. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never in my life even used that command. And whenever I search through a man page, I just search in my browser um, because there is web man page versions, and those are much more convenient for me. So the work that this trigger is imposing onto my system at installation time is entirely unnecessary. And whenever I install a new package, that thing is being done from scratch, and it slows down my package installation. Furthermore, because hooks are arbitrary code, um, they're not written in a way that would be inherently concurrency safe. There's not even any primitives to do that. Typically, they're just shell scripts. So package managers need to run these one after the other, and this entirely precludes concurrent package installation, which in this day and age of many core processors would really be a big speed up. 
And then lastly, we're talking about arbitrary code, and we're lucky if that code is even peer-reviewed. In many distributions, it is not. So the bar is typically that the code will be shipped whenever it starts working, not whenever it's actually fast. So my claim is that we can actually build a fully functioning Linux system without having any hooks or triggers. And the way to approach this is twofold. The first one is that whenever we have a a piece of common functionality that many different packages need, um, the packages should declare what they need uh, instead of containing the instructions of how to get there. So for example, if a package needs another user to be added to the system so that it can run a daemon as that user, it should ship a systemd sysusers file and then the package manager should make sure that systemd sysusers runs after the installation. And you can generalize this to pretty much anything that you need to be modified in the system and then the implementation lives entirely inside the package manager so it can be concurrent, it can be fast, it can be correct, it will be peer reviewed. And secondly, for the cases where we don't have common functionality, but one-off functionality that is very specific to one individual package, we would move the work from package installation time to program execution time. So as an example, the SSH server needs to create a host key for cryptography. And uh, it typically creates it in a hook that comes with the package. So after installation, it would create this key. However, I think it would be better if we would create the key in an SSHD wrapper script so that, for example, if you only want to install the SSH server and not actually ever start it, you don't do unnecessary work. There's a secondary benefit here, which is that when you're distributing operating system images, such as images for the Raspberry Pi to put on your SD card, um, you are in a tough spot because the package installation hooks are not going to run, and yet you want a different host key for every Raspberry Pi because otherwise the cryptography is useless. So it's actually better if you can just not ship the host key on the image and rely on the program doing at program execution time whatever is necessary to make the program actually start. There are very few exceptions to this where you need to actually break this model. And the only one that I know of is bootloaders and firmware, where the files that are being installed are living outside of the file system. So for example, a bootloader, you need to write it into the master boot record of your hard disk. Or firmware, you might need to flash it onto your 10 gigabit network interface card or whatever you have. Um, so these obviously don't fall into the model. So now that I've talked a bunch about all of these ideas, you might be wondering, well, how practical is it actually to implement a system like that. And uh, I have implemented a Fuse file system which provides the slash RO mount point with all of the packages in their separate hierarchies. It was actually easier to implement a Fuse daemon than to manage these separate mount points, overlays, UnionFS, and whatever else you need to make the kernel do this work programmatically. In fact, it also turned out to be faster. My initial prototype was using programmatic management of mount points, etc. And uh, when I switched to the Fuse daemon, I noticed a drop of many, um, like five to 10 seconds for composing a build environment to a fraction of a second. And I mentioned this to a kernel developer friend of mine, and he explained that kernel mounts are just a linked list. So as you have more and more of them, they get slow. Um, I think also it takes a longer time to open a SquashFS file system in the kernel than it does in user space. With regards to the packages themselves, they don't typically need modification, but they do need to be built with the dash dash prefix configure flag. Um, you can see here an example of how to compile Nginx. You need to tell it where it's going to be in the file system after installation. This is because sometimes the packages embed these paths and use them to find additional resources. There are a small number of packages that actually need to be patched. Uh, sometimes they have path-related issues. For example, there might be systemd service files that hard code a specific path that then doesn't exist. Um, or there might be uh, path issues in GCC, Gobject, Automake, a couple of them. And then there's one other category of issues, which is very deep system integration. For example, the Draycut program to generate an init RAMFS needs to be told that we have this model of hermetic packages where it's not enough to just install the wrapper script, you also need to install the actual program in the init RAMFS, otherwise it can't be started. And I should also add that the removal of hooks from the system is not for everybody. Some people might actually like the configuration layers such as StepConv or YAST or whatever other distributions use, um, but I personally think that it shouldn't be there. So, to recap, why can distrib be faster than existing distributions? Well, traditionally, we said that we would need to resolve dependencies, download the packages, possibly download metadata, extract archives, configure software, do all of this with fsync system calls to make it safe. 
In this tree, we don't need to resolve dependencies. The package manager is entirely version agnostic. We only need to download images. We don't need to extract any archives. We don't need to configure any software. There's no hooks and triggers. And unsafe I.O. is totally OK. I've actually measured this, and package installation in Distri scales to 12 plus gigabytes per second on a 100 gigabit link when just using Go's standard NetHTTP package. So if you compare this, like the data rate of 1.x megabytes per second in established distributions to 12 gigabytes per second, kind of makes you think. So in conclusion, I'm saying that append-only package stores are more elegant than mutable systems that we work with today. It's a simpler design, and it is a faster implementation that comes out of it. The exchange directories can be used to make things seem normal enough to third-party software. So software that is not yet packaged for Distri can just be compiled, and even closed-source software can just be run because they think it's a normal enough Linux system. And lastly, all of these ideas are actually practical, because live CDs with their read-only environments and cross-compilation with weird dash dash prefix arguments and path issues have already paved the way for this model. Now, let me also say very clearly that the project goals are not to get any of you to actually use this system. I'm not trying to build a community or a user base. However, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, this tree is a vehicle for me to do Linux distribution research. I publish blog posts about the subject, and I want to show established distributions that they're leaving a lot to be desired when it comes to package installation speed. I think package managers should be a lot quicker, should be a lot easier to work with. So um, this is the regularly scheduled part of the slides. You can learn more about the project at distry.org. The second I is spelled as a one. Um, if you scan this QR code, you're going to go to a feedback form. Please give me some feedback for this talk. You can also click on the link later on uh, meetup.com. I'm going to share the slides. Um, and we still have a couple of minutes, eight minutes left for uh, questions. If you have them, um, we have a handheld mic here. Um, if uh, somebody could be so nice as to pass it out to people who have questions, thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to say thank you for your attention. Uh, one, two, yeah. yeah. Uh, size. Uh, size? Yeah. <laughs> of what? Of, uh, so if I install stuff and then I install other stuff with other dependencies, how much bigger? Ah, right. Um, yeah, so there is um, no deduplication on that level. You could always run it on a file system that does deduplication. But I also will note that you will just have, like, uh, if of the distri release that is currently out there, there's no duplication in there. So there's not going to be two different versions of a library. But I think what you're asking is if you install that snapshot and then you're going to update your system, sure, it's going to grow. Um, and if you install all of the packages that you have in two different versions, you're going to have 200% space usage, of course. Um, it is up to you to then actually do a removal of the old versions that you don't want anymore. Um, you can do that at any point in time. You could, for example, couple that with the installation process itself, um, so to mirror the behavior of existing distributions. Or you could say, I'm just going to ever install, and whenever I need space, I'm going to clean it up. Uh, but uh, there can also be the case that you have uh, A, uh, so you have package B which depends on A, yep. and then you have package C which depends also on A, yep. and B, the version of B you uh, installed works with 2.7 yep. A, and the other with 2.8, but the yep. other would be also fine with 2.8. So uh, do you have something like... Uh, right. Um, so the way Distri approaches this is that whenever you build the package, you make the decision of which dependencies it uses. Can so you, it is can up you to the package maintainer. Plus? Can you say 2.7 plus? No, you cannot. It is always pinned. So that, that would make it much bigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By default, it will be bigger. Yeah. But, you know, I have a terabyte in this laptop. Question up there. Um, yeah. In the meantime, let me just uh, do the quick reveal that, of course, um, the system that I'm presenting from um, is also running Distri. So you can see that I have Chrome packaged here. Uh, you can see the proc PS, set shell, my terminal emulator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so this is not only practical; it's practical enough for me to actually present from it. Um, my benchmark was: Can I watch Netflix movies on it? And I can. So I'm done. Excellent. Question. Yes. Uh, so without support for hooks, how do you go about building, say, third-party modules if you update your kernel through the distri right. package manager? Right. The DKMS question, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, you currently cannot. 
Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, in general, the idea is that you would need to do that manually, right? So um, as I mentioned uh, to the previous question, if you have things like that where you say, oh, for this set of computers, I need to do, uh, for example, an installation and an immediate cleanup afterwards because I'm short on space, you could just say, oh, yeah, install and and cleanup. Uh, in your case, you could do an install and then tie it. Um, why is this not properly presenting? Um, okay, whatever. Um, you could then tie it to uh, running a DKMS thing, right? It's up to you. It, like th this is a thing that I want to leave as a policy question instead of uh, an, a force that goes into the model and changes the model, right? Because I think if the model is really bare bones, it allows you to focus on what is really important, and then anything else you can kind of add on top of that. All right. Uh, maybe another question. And you said it, it doesn't support uh, dependency resolution. Yeah. Um, how do you go about updating just one package then? Um, uh, well, would it, so would it not find its dependencies, I guess? Or? It would, um, because um, it doesn't do uh, resolution in the sense of avoiding conflicts, but it does fetch just enough metadata so that it can actually install the package and every other package that it needs that you don't have on your system yet. Question up there. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, how do you see it in comparison to the Ubuntu approach with SnapD? Right, um, so Snap and AppImage and Flatpak are all projects that are somewhere in this space. Um, most of them are only targeting individual application distributions, so they're not applying this model to the entirety of a Linux distribution. And I'm thinking that it is interesting to see if it works in general, and not only if it can be bolted on top of an existing base foundation that somehow is different. Um, and also, some of these don't actually go far enough. Um, so some of them don't properly um, have like the entire closure of dependencies pinned to a specific version. Many of them have sort of base layers that are like you know Ubuntu in version 18.04 or so, and then you build your program on top of that. Which you know I understand why they're doing it. It's just not what I want to explore in this project. Okay, cool. Thank you. I, I have a question, actually. Yeah. Um, facetiously, facetiously, does this run in Docker? I spent a lot of time it building does run Docker, in Docker. Even with the Fuse system for the yes, string directory. Yes, even then you do need to run it with a couple of ugly flags though. So it's not uh, in a position where you could use it in your CI CD environments, I think. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to check it out, you could run it in Docker, you can run it in QMU, you can boot it from a USB stick. We have a whole bunch of different options for you to easily check it out. <clears throat> I guess this is entirely written in Go. Yes. Uh, how many lines of Go are Ooh, we talking about? Uh, yeah, let's find out. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, I should probably do it uh, like this. 10,000-ish? Um, yeah, maybe maybe that or somewhere along these lines, yeah. Um, yeah, it's entirely written in Go. I think it actually embodies a, a bunch of the Go values. Like It is simple, it is minimal, it is fast, tries to be fast, tries to not do unnecessary work. Um, I think it aligns pretty well, and I'm very pleased with how Go enables me to do all of these uh, things, all of the research. So if you've ever wondered whether Go would be a good fit for you know, running in your init RD and setting up a Fuse file system from which you then start a Linux system, yes, it is. Okay. Um, until you think of more questions, um, I can actually... Uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, I had one demo, which is... Um, yeah, I've prepared my system to not have Vim. Um, this was uh, like, I released it without Vim and then somebody complains so I added it. Um, but um, if we do sudo distri install Vim, then uh, you can see that it's now installing the package. Um, it took 8.44 megabytes per second. This is purely Wi-Fi throughput. Um, this was served outside of my kitchen from at home. So uh, that's pretty cool. If you're installing distri and you're installing packages, they're coming outside of my kitchen. <laughs> Uh, I, I have posed a philosophical question recently of uh, when uh, does it stop being a kitchen that has multiple servers in it and when does it start to become a data center in which you can cook? <laughs> so yeah, you can see that all of this works. Um, I think I could also like um, build a package for you. I don't know which one I had. Oh yeah, um, the i 3 lock screen locker. Um, I have an alias. You can see that this is now already running the configure. So the whole build environment composition that I mentioned happened so quickly you couldn't even see it. And now it's just compiling the i3 lock uh, screen locker program, um, which, you know, that takes a little while, but that's up to the program. Uh, so you can see this all completed in 13 seconds. And if we uh, scroll up a little bit to where Distri was doing its thing, you can see that here is where it started. 
Um, then it looked at the dependencies, it mounted a bunch of different programs. You can see the usual suspects in here, you know, make the Linux kernel header files, grep, core utils, etc. And then it started building the thing. And it will uh, mount packages on demand in the build environment. Uh, so you do need to specify it so that the dependency closure is pinned, but um, everything is lazy and only whenever necessary. Okay, I'm almost out of time, so is there any final question? Uh, yeah, over here in the very front. And you also had a question. Maybe we can squeeze it in. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. So uh, you don't resolve uh, uh, conflicts? Yes. Right, but uh, I, I, I still don't understand. So then you would just install what you need to install and then find out that it won't work? No, uh, it's not meant like that. So. Um, the conflict resolution is typically a feature that package managers and other distributions do at the beginning because you can only have one version of a certain library installed on your system at the same time. Now, in Distri, this is not the case because everything is encapsulated in the separate hierarchies. So you can have, for example, libjpeg 9.2.1 and libjpeg 9.2.2 installed at the same time. So in order to install a program, you don't need to resolve conflicts there. Um, you still need to resolve the dependencies, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but yeah, the conflict resolution only comes in when you're actually dealing with resources that can conflict with each other. For example, names on your shell. So uh, if I'm running vim here, then I can actually do um, a list on bin vim, and you can see that it resolves to vim 8.1-1 at, at the time right now. But if I were to install another version of it, I could choose as a user to run the other version, or, and that's when we need to resolve the conflict, the package manager in slash bin will actually tell you, oh, okay, it's now the newer version. Um, so it, it only, by default, it only ever gives you the latest version if you're going via slash bin, but if you manually specify the full path of what you want to execute, that's not the case. But you do have a strategy for choosing what packages to install, right? I mean, uh, following uh, well, transitive dependencies. And yes, uh, so when the user says, I want to install a package, I install that package and all of the dependencies in precisely that version as they were when the package maintainer built that package. We can talk through it later if it's still not clear. Um, I think Thank we you. have Thank one you. more question up there and then we're going to move on to the next talk. Uh, what does your package file look like? Or I don't know, package script file, like the equivalent of package config in, say, uh, Arc Linux? Yeah, um, so the packages are essentially a SquashFS file system image. Um, if I just list the contents, you can see that it just has like all of the files that need to be installed in here. And then there's like a little metadata file next to it um, where we will have um, all of the runtime dependencies that need to be on the system and a little more detail. So that's essentially my package format. It's two files, one SquashFS image, one metadata file. And how do you then build each, say, package? Do you build it manually or do you have like a... Oh, I just showed you system? in the demo how I build a package, right? Like oh, that okay. was what I, what I demonstrated before. Um, the, uh, let's see, oh, this is too long ago. I'm just going to rebuild it. It's quicker. Um, <laughs> so, so this is how I build a package, right? The distri tool has a build command and then it will actually compile the package as per the instructions in the build file, um, and then just package all of the results up into the SquashFS image. Yeah, there we go. So here it says it created the SquashFS image, can list it, can see, okay, there's my files. Cool, okay, well, thanks again. <laughs>